This is a presentation about my novel Accession, which will be published in August 2016 by Penguin Random House. I wanted to put the covers of all the trilogy together to show you how nice they look. I'm really pleased with the production and presentation of these books. Accession continues the story of Margaret Beaufort, mother of Henry Tudor. It begins after the Battle of Tewkesbury when Henry has gone into exile in Brittany and Margaret, as part of her campaign to get him back safely into England, arranges her own fourth marriage to Thomas Stanley, King of Man, a wealthy widower who has some influence over the King. Stanley plays a somewhat ambiguous role in The Wars of the Roses. He is chiefly famous for failing to turn up when summoned to battle, yet somehow he retained the favour of various kings. This suggested to me a shrewd diplomat and a calculating man, which traits seem also to be suggested by this portrait. The fact that Margaret was prepared to marry him shows the length she would go to to ensure her son's safe return to England. There is no suggestion that they got on, at least initially. However, the marriage brings her closer to the throne, which in turn makes it possible for her to bargain with Edward IV. For the first 12 years of the period covered by my novel, Edward IV was king. He was married to Elizabeth Woodville and they have 10 children, though only three of them are sons and the youngest, George, dies in infancy. Edward was notoriously promiscuous, but he had a sustained affair with Elizabeth Jane Shaw, known to us as Jane Shaw. As Thomas More put it, many he had, but her he loved. One of the many great things about writing these novels was that I got to visit several interesting places. Pembroke Castle, for instance, where Henry Tudor was born, and various battle sites. But my favourite trip was to Brittany, where I had a wonderful time staying with two lovely people, Dot and Terry Devie Smith. I met Dot through the MA course at MMU, where I was teaching, and she invited me to her home and took me herself to the Tour d'Elven near Vannes, where Henry was imprisoned for many years. This is what was left of his room. You can get a sense of how small it was was. There are wonderful views over the forest but it's not clear how much freedom Henry was allowed. The Duke of Brittany treated Henry and his uncle Jasper Tudor well but he was under considerable pressure from the kings of both France and England to give them up. He kept them however promising only to increase the severity of their confinement. So while initially the fugitives were kept together in the fortress of Lagoet Henry was kept alone. Edward IV made several attempts to have him returned and it was not clear whether he would have killed him as the last surviving member of the House of Lancaster or married him into his own family. At one point he promised Margaret Beaufort that he would marry him into his family and even to one of his daughters. Elizabeth of York was mentioned but she was already betrothed. The third novel in my trilogy also deals inevitably with the princes in the tower and the dramatic events of 1483, which is so eventful that it deserves a novel all on its own. Edward IV dies, but not before changing his will. His older son is declared king, then taken into custody by his uncle Richard of Gloucester, who has Elizabeth Woodville's brother and the son of her first marriage executed. Queen Elizabeth goes into sanctuary but is persuaded to give up her youngest son to his uncle Richard, who then has Elizabeth's marriage declared invalid, all her children illegitimate, and is crowned himself. The fate of the princes in the tower, he depicted by Samuel Cousins, has never been resolved. One of the fascinating things that happened while I was writing these novels is that Richard's body was uncovered in the car park in Leicester. The image on the left is from the reconstruction of his face. The portrait on the right is, was painted some time after his death. I think these two images capture the essence of the two Richards that have been passed down to us in history. They are recognisably the same man, but seem to suggest two different temperaments and personalities. Could the first Richard have murdered his nephews? Could the second? Well, obviously I have my own take on this, but you will have to read the novel to find out. 
Accession and the whole trilogy culminates with the Battle of Bosworth at which Richard's forces meet Henry Tudor's. Henry is totally outnumbered and reliant on the decision of his treacherous stepfather, Thomas Stanley, who, with his brother William Stanley, will turn the course of events. England's history at this time seems to turn on a hair, another reason why Henry VII is sometimes described as England's unlikeliest king. He was no warrior, had no experience of battle, so his role was to stand by his standard bearer, bearer in order to be visible to his troops. Richard, however, was an experienced general and an exceptionally brave warrior. Even his detractors say he died a hero's death. The central image seems to be of Richard fighting before he fell from his horse. At which point he went on fighting, determined to reach Henry Tudor and kill him. He got as far as killing Henry's standard bearer before William Stanley's men fell on him and he died of multiple wounds. So Henry was king, and it was the end of an era for England. Richard III is sometimes described as England's last medieval king. Henry was no warrior, as I've said, and he had no supporting dynasty behind him, so he was forced to adopt a dis different style of kingship. Essentially, he ushered in the era of early capitalism, where England depended on trade and bureaucracy rather than warfare. Of course, by marrying Elizabeth of York, Henry managed to unite the houses of Lancaster and York. The story of his reign and his marriage is a fascinating one, but my story ends here, just after Bosworth. Margaret Beaufort is finally mother of the king. It's said she wept marvellously at his coronation as well she might. She had orchestrated the earlier rebellion that failed in 1483, and was attainted at that point and handed over to the custody of her husband, Thomas Stanley, who kept her in one of his fortresses in the north. She also orchestrated the betrothal between Elizabeth of York and her son, using her doctor as go-between between between herself and Elizabeth Woodville in sanctuary. Using her priest as a spy, she began the second conspiracy, and this time her efforts were successful. 28 years of separation from her son were finally over. It is often said that she ruled with him and after his death she became England's first female regent. So hers is a remarkable story and one that I felt really deserved to be told.